Hi, I'm Craig. And I'm Linda. And this is the Indie Travel Podcast at IndieTravelPodcast.com. This is episode 361, and we're talking about what to pack in your underseat carry-on bag. Wow. It's very specific. It is very specific. Well, we wanted to talk about what to pack in your carry-on bag, but we travel with just carry-on bags. So this is specifically for the bag that you take with you on the plane to have stuff with you that you need, you know, like a bottle of water or entertainment, that kind of thing. Yeah, that idea of traveling carry-on only is so important. I guess we'll touch on that again uh, very soon. But first of all, let's chat about what we've been up to over the, the last little while. In fact, it's been quite a while since our last show. Yeah, we've both had quite amazing colds, which is one of the reasons why it's been, I think, about six weeks since our last podcast. So I'm really sorry about that. And we've also been traveling rather intensely. So, yeah, we are currently in Melbourne, Australia, hanging out with my sister and my two awesome nephews. But yeah, we've been pretty busy. Yeah, the last time that we chatted with you, we were in Bristol in the UK. So we're almost at the opposite end of the earth right now. And it's been really cool. One of my highlights of being in Bristol was some of the little day trips and half day trips that we did. One out to Cheltenham, which was a beautiful town, Regency town, beautiful buildings, good food, great beer. Amazing time. And another trip out to Thatcher's, which didn't have great beer. Thatcher's <laughs> is, uh, in fact, a cidery. So there was a cider factory and amazing orchards. Yeah, so it's a family-owned place. And it was really cool to see, like, to hear the history about how the company came into being. Because actually it was originally a farm, and all farms in the area had to provide cider for their workers. And so that's what Thatcher's did. And then their cider got better and better and they started selling it and then they sold more cider than they did stuff from the farm. And so now it's all just cider. I don't think they have a farm at all, except for obviously the orchards. So yeah, it was really interesting. Yeah, a really pretty little village pub that's been expanded to uh, account for the, the growth in trade. And one of my favorite things there was their heritage orchard, where they've got hundreds and hundreds of different types of apple trees uh, that they got when a scientific institute had to close down. Yeah. And they transplanted all of this genetic material, all of these different apple trees into this one massive orchard. So it was really cool. Yeah, and we've also done a couple of other trips. Well, I went across to Ibiza because, well, I knew I needed a bit of a holiday from hanging out in Bristol or just needed a break from work. And one of my friends has a holiday home over there that had been squatted several times over the years. And they'd finally managed to get through the courts and the, the legal processes in Spain to get it back. And she sent an email out to her friends going, who can come and help me out? So I said, oh, yeah, I can. Found some cheap flights from Bristol and, and just went across for the weekend. And it was really cool. Well, I say cool, but I spent the weekend kind of elbow deep in, mm -hmm. in dishes, washing all of the dishes and cleaning the whole kitchen and getting things back to normal. So, yeah, it was quite an interesting experience. Absolutely. Well, from Bristol, we jumped up to London uh, to exit the UK from, but also to go to WTM, World Travel Market, which is a big travel trade show. Caught up with a lot of our friends in the blogging world and in the travel industry and basically had a great time. Uh, we also saw some friends from the distant, distant past that we are new from English teaching. And if you remember, if you're old and gray like we are, <laughs> you might remember way back to the start of the podcast, 2006 was when we started. In 2007, we got a job with a company which would send us to teach English to different schools in Europe. And uh, we met up with some of our friends from that time. So that was amazing. And uh, yeah, harks right back to the early days of the Indie Travel Podcast. Yeah, it was really cool. And after we saw our friends from, from that time, we got on a boat to head to WTM, which was all the way out past Greenwich. And so we could go travel along the Thames on this boat. And then we got on the Emirates Airline cable car to go across to where the conference was being held. So that was really great. That was neat. It was very scenic. And about that time, even though we had both had colds for a week or so, it was about then that we got absolutely smashed with our colds. And yeah. so life just hasn't quite been the same since. And you're still here two weeks later. I'm still pretty croaky. So apologies for uh, my voice on the show. So, yeah, we spent a bit of time in London with my brother as well and his wife, which was always really nice. Uh, we went to see The Mousetrap, which I've been wanting to see for ages, and it was really fun. So this is an Agatha Christie play, and it's 
been running. It's the longest running play of all time. I think it's been running for 67 years. Yeah. It's some ridiculous amount of time anyway. And it was quite fun to go and see it. It was. It was. From London, we jumped down to Cyprus, which was a new country for us. In fact, we managed to visit two new countries because there's Cyprus, which is the southern part of the island in the Mediterranean, which is most similar to Greek culture. And then northern Cyprus is its own country, and that is Turkish occupied and feels a lot more Middle Eastern and and Turkish. So really fascinating to see these two different types of cities side by side. And in fact, Nicosia or Lefkosia is one city with those two cultures right in the middle of it. Mm, you really got the feeling of, you know, there's, there's a barrier and there's a no-go zone. And it really reminded me of how I imagined the Berlin Wall to be, but a lot more friendly. So just the, the one city divided feeling. Yeah, well, I guess you got the Greek military on one side, mm. the UN military in the middle, and then the Turkish military on the other side. Exactly. So it's, yeah. The getting across was really easy. You just had to have your passport. You went through passport control twice, but there was no problem. Yeah, yeah. And some beautiful, uh, beautiful buildings and interesting stuff on both sides. Uh, but we actually stayed down on the coast near the airport in a town called Larnaca which was really set up for your kind of mass tourism, short-term holiday kind of stuff. But it was off-season, and so it wasn't absolutely teeming with people and horrible. And in fact, it felt really nice in the off-season. Yeah, and we had one restaurant that we kept going back to for lunch for uh, souvlaki wraps. And on our last day, we went in, and I ordered my regular thing, and the waiter said, oh, and you want this. And he remembered Craig's order. And it just felt really nice because... I, I think for us, we really love to travel in a place and become temporary locals. And moments like this really, I don't know, show that we're, we're doing that. And then we told him that we were leaving and he came back with a little present for us. It was just a magnet, but it was really cool. Yeah, yeah, it was a nice touch as we left. Eh? Yeah, yeah, it was cool. That was great. Yeah, we're flying out of Athens down to, to Melbourne. And so we had to jump from Cyprus into Athens. And we just spent a day at an Airbnb near the airport walked down to the beach, but the weather was horrendous and we were both feeling under the weather. So we spent most of the day just, you know, moping around yeah. <laughs> and uh, and working before we headed out to the airport the next morning. And gosh, that was a long trip. It sure was. We had a whole day, almost a whole day in Singapore. I think it was 20 hours was our, our stopover. And we hadn't booked a hotel or anything. We arrived, we found some of these like snooze lounges where you can lie down, almost lie down, in the airport and had a bit of a nap. Then we got up and we signed up for a, a free city tour. So Singapore Airport arranges for you to go into the city with a guide for free. And so we thought, well, that sounds like a good idea. And it was great because Craig had never been to Singapore, so he got a, a bit of a mini tour. And, yeah, we had about two hours. We got off the bus a couple of times. We got to see the Merlion. It was it was fun. And then we were back in the airport. Uh, we found one of the movie theaters, went to see a movie, and then we went to a lounge and just spent the rest of our time eating and drinking. Yeah, Singapore Airport really is almost a destination in itself. And the, they're showing some promo things for the new terminal that they're opening next year. And it is just going to be stupendous. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, this airport has several different gardens. It has two or three movie theaters. It has dozens of lounges. Of mm -hmm. course, all of the, the shops that you'd expect. But it's all of the little things, like going and walking in a cactus garden or going yeah. to the butterfly garden and hanging out with the butterflies. It's, um, yeah, just a really cool airport. Yeah, it was really awesome. Then onwards to Melbourne. So with about 20 hours in the air and about 20 hours in the airport, we arrived in Melbourne pretty tired. Just been spending time with family and going out for, yeah, meeting up with everyone, really. Yeah, it's yeah. been cool that catches you up with <laughs> been to uh we've actually been traveling yeah. for a while yeah yeah it's been crazy reminded me of our episode on what to do when you're traveling when you're sick because we yeah. have really had to kind of look after our energy levels quite a lot to make the most of the unique times that's like, right uh you know our day trip up over the border in uh cyprus northern cyprus and a big day in Singapore exploring and things mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, it's true. I mean, you have to look after yourself when you're sick. Luckily, we haven't been really, really sick. We've just been kind of under the weather. So we've had to do a lot more energy management rather than go to bed and, you know, have chicken soup. But, um, yeah, I think that's something to be aware of, managing your time, managing your energy when you're not feeling so great. Yeah, we've got a whole episode on that, and you can check it out at IndieTravelPodcast.com. 
So before we get into talking about what to pack in your carry-on bag, we'd like to thank our sponsor. And the sponsor for this episode of the Indie Travel Podcast is Smart Buy Glasses. It's an online glasses retailer. It's all about making eyewear accessible and also improving the vision of the world, one lens at a time. Yeah, on that, they have a project called Buy One, Give One, which helps bring glasses to underserved communities that don't have great access to optometry. They've donated $2.3 million worth of glasses so far. So you can get new glasses and help out someone else who needs new glasses. And the glasses are original, they're affordable, and they're also guaranteed, which is always a good thing. Yeah, they have a great range, the largest range in the world. They have exclusive brands and styles as well as those that you'd expect. So visit smartbuyglasses.co.nz to check them out. If you're not in New Zealand, you'll be directed to the best store for you. Having just done 12 hours, then, I don't know, 8 or 9 hours in the air, I was reminded that for a comfortable flight, it's really helpful to have certain things within reach. And that means thinking carefully about what to put in your carry-on bag, or, you know, the small bag that you bring with you to... uh store in the overhead locker or under the seat in front of you. (laughs) Yeah, so most of the time you're going to have one bag. I mean, we recommend carrying on just the one bag, uh, not taking a suitcase with you, although we say that, but on this trip we actually brought a suitcase with us because we have so much stuff that we're bringing back from Europe, including a photo book that we've actually finally managed to make, a sleeping bag that I don't know where it came from. I think that was one of the things that we'd left in El Gladianares. So we've got all this stuff. We did check a suitcase this time. But we really strongly recommend when you're packing to travel, just take one carry-on size bag. But then when you're getting on the plane, there are certain things that you want to have with you at your seat. So what kind of things do you need to have with you in your seat? The smaller bag, like your handbag or your laptop bag that you keep with you for your journey. And yeah, as I said, we've had a lot of time to think about this and refine our list because we've just done all of these flights, right? Yeah, was it? London to Cyprus to Athens to Singapore to Melbourne, and then we'll be doing to Christchurch and then to Auckland. So that's seven flights to kind of, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Which whittle this down and make sure we haven't forgotten anything. This list we're going to go through is suitable for all of them, but it's best for those long legs because, you know, the longer you're in the seat, the more fractious and less comfortable you're going to get. Yes, particularly if you've been allocated a window seat. So if you're on the window, you're likely to have to get past two people to get to the aisle, right? And so... When you're taking off or when the seatbelt sign is on, it's a bit hard to get to the bag that's, you know, in the overhead locker. So you really want to make sure you have the things you need with you. So a bit of a caveat, before you fly, before you get to the airport, check the carry-on baggage rules for each of the countries or even airports that you're going through. Because every airline has different luggage rules about the, the size and number of bags you can bring on. And then every airport interprets the uh, global guidelines a little bit differently. And life can become pretty hard. Yeah, so recently, budget airlines have also started to change their rules. So we started traveling carry-on size because budget airlines started charging for chicken bags. That was one of the main reasons we did it. Uh, we wanted to save money. But also, in the end, it's better because you don't you have less stuff with you and you don't have to collect your bag and baggage claim. But just recently, budget airlines have started changing the rules again, and they started charging for carry-on bags. Either, I think Ryanair, what they did was they changed it so that if you wanted to guarantee to be able to carry your bag on with you, you had to pay an extra five euros, which we did because we wanted to guarantee to carry our bag on with us. Otherwise, there was a chance that it would be gate-checked. And since we didn't want to have to wait at the baggage carousel, we thought, okay, better to pay the five euros. But some airlines just charge you straight out. If you want a large carry-on size bag, then you have to pay for it. For example, Wizz Air, they've done this for years. Uh, If you just want a handbag, that's free. But if you want to carry on a regular size bag, then you have to pay a certain amount for that. So it's really worth looking at the baggage rules before you start, I mean, before you're ready to go, or even when you're buying your tickets, because it might work out cheaper to just get a chicken bag. Yeah, and if you do decide to bring your larger bag with you on board like we try to, do check the rules around second bags. Most airlines will allow you to carry a handbag or laptop bag as well as your quote-unquote carry-on luggage, but others strictly enforce a one-bag rule. That's not a problem. We've had that quite a bit, and in that case, we actually put the smaller bag inside the larger one, so it does mean you need to make sure that you can get down to one bag. We'll do that, and when we get to our seat, 
unzip the top of the larger bag, pull out the smaller bag, put it down, and then store the, the larger bag up top and have the small one with us at the seat. So yeah, I think it's about preparation and just knowing what you're going to do. So let's talk about which bag to bring. So I'm sure you've already got your larger carry-on size bag or your backpack or whichever bag you put most of your stuff in. But what bag should you have with you at your seat? Well, if you've got a, a handbag that's the right size for all these bits and pieces, just use that. Craig uses a very nice leather laptop satchel. It's very pretty. It's a little bit heavy, but it does fit everything you want, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's kind of my mobile office. Mm -hmm. So it's got everything I need, and then I can uh, normally stuff a bottle of water and some, some mints and other bits and pieces. But it's where all of my electronics go most of the time. Yeah, and it's got nice dividers so you can put things in different places so it's all organized. Personally, I just have a super lightweight stuffed down backpack. It's 10 liters. It's super small. It packs down to smaller than my fist. So when I'm not using it, it just takes up no space in my bag. But when I am using it, I can put quite a lot of stuff in it, actually. Now, the items that you're going to put in this little bag should help ensure that you're comfortable and entertained on board. And that does mean you might need a bit of preparation. So for uh, all your electronics, make sure they're fully charged. Download your podcasts, movies, music, ebooks to your phone or your tablet or both. Uh, make sure you've got a range of books on your Kindle. Check that you don't have any sharp objects. That includes things like bottle openers, obviously knives. Check that you don't have any toiletries that are in bottles that are larger than 100 mils or whatever your local rules are. And uh, already put those in a clear Ziploc bag. In fact, you know, I've realized that I've completely got rid of toiletries bags, which I used to carry around all the time. Mm -hmm. And now... Everything goes in that clear Ziploc bag, and that's become my toiletries bag. So there's probably some manufacturer shaking their head somewhere over this massive downturn in sales. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's get on to talk about what are you actually going to put in this bag. We've come a long way to get to this point. <laughs> but what are we going to put in this bag? So let's start with essentials. So some of these things uh, you'll be carrying on your person, preferably in a pocket. However... Women's fashion does tend to be noticeably lacking in pockets. I'm not bitter at all. So you might actually have to have it in your handbag or your, your carry-on bag. So first of all, your passport. Essential. Or if you're traveling locally, an ID card. Some sort of proof of identity. Yeah, along with that, you'll need your tickets or your boarding passes. Uh, I'll assume that you've got your wallet with your credit and debit cards and cash for your destination. And one thing that I always forget is that ancient bit of technology, a pen. And the reason you'll want a pen is for filling in arrivals cards, customs declarations, all that kind of stuff. If you forget a pen, you can ask the flight attendants, but you'll be asking for their personal pen. So make sure to return it as soon as you can. Ah, oh, the luxuries of air travel, eh? Yeah, definitely, definitely try to take a pen with you. On my recent trip to Ibiza, I had to ask someone for to borrow a pen, and it was just embarrassing. I had a pencil, but I don't know why I had a pencil and not a pen. But yeah, definitely take a pen with you. Now, the longer the flight, the more entertainment you're likely to want. And some planes do still have free onboard entertainment, but many, many are now charging for access. Some of them, like Air New Zealand, have a split service system. So there's selected movies and TV shows that are free, and they're charging for others, which are normally the newer releases and premium stuff. So whether or not it's included, it's definitely worth bringing your own because that flight entertainment system might be down on your flight. Shock, horror, <laughs> ah. So do take a range of options for yourself on different devices so that you're covered for whatever you feel like to keep your brain going during these long flights. And yeah, if you do run out of juice, you've got a backup for whatever device ran out of batteries. So first of all, I always take a Kindle, but you might want to take a physical book or a magazine. You'll want your phone and or a tablet. Um, I recommend earphones, preferably noise-canceling ones, if at all possible, uh, so you can listen to music or audiobooks or watch a video. If you're traveling with a computer, have that with you, even if you're you know, not going to use it for entertainment, but never leave your computer in your checked bag for sure. And you'll want charges and cables for all of these things because there's nothing worse than, you know, having your bag checked 
and then ar- arriving and it's missing. It's going to arrive two or three days later, but all of your power cables are in there. So do bring your chargers and cables with you. Keep them with the device and bring a power pack if if that's your thing. Yeah. Also, if you have a stopover somewhere, you might be able to charge up your devices. Uh, some planes have charging on board. You might be able to make use of that. Cool. Let's switch from keeping the brain going to turning the brain off. Um, How can you be comfortable if you're trying to sleep on board? I think that there's all sorts of amazing, weird devices and systems people have come up with to try and get comfy. I find them a bit over the top and, uh, you know, it's not really my thing. So, yeah, we've just got a few simple things that we bring with us. So, first of all, I recommend a neck pillow. Uh, there are some really amazing ones with micro balls and things like that. We just use a cheap blow up one that we got on a flight here in Australia, actually, because that packs down really small. So when I'm not using it, it doesn't take up any space. Also, an eye mask and earplugs. Craig just likes to wear his over ear noise cancelling headphones rather than using earplugs, but I prefer to just turn off completely. And I also recommend if you're traveling and you wear glasses like we do, bring a glasses case so you can take your glasses off and put them in the seat pocket in front of you. And that means that they're that much less likely to get destroyed. Yeah, definitely. I'll tuck mine into the the top of my shirt. And I have found sometimes when my chin goes forward and it, you know, bangs the glasses and misshapes the frames. It's, yeah, not the best. So, yeah, Linda's more prepared version of carrying a glasses case with her is not a bad idea. Yeah, it's the one thing I forget when I'm packing. I always go, I get on board and I'm like, oh, that's right, my glasses case. But I actually remembered it this time, so I'm pretty proud of myself. Yeah, so these things, although simple and normally enough to get comfortable enough, you know, it's like the 80-20 rule. These are the simple things you can do to get most of the available comfort. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, there's all sorts of weird and wacky things out there that I've seen, like slings and mini hammocks and, <laughs> you know, stuff that you put over the top of the seat in front of you and then you can lean your head against and all sorts of, yeah, amazing stuff. It's, yeah. it's worth some time trolling through Pinterest and Reddit to <laughs> to, to find all these weird things. Okay, the next point is sustenance. So you need to make sure that you have enough food and drink on board to keep you going. Now, some airlines will provide you with food, some won't. Make sure to check which camp your plane falls into. We were actually on a flight recently, and they gave us a snack. And we were amazed because we've been flying so many budget flights recently that we weren't expecting anything for free. So we really enjoyed those pretzels. But um, once, after a long-haul flight, I had this pain in my leg, and I panicked because I thought I had deep vein thrombosis. And I called the like National Health Line, and uh, they weren't very helpful. They made me panic even more. So we, we drove really quickly to the emergency room, and I was so stressed. And the doctor was so lovely. She calmed me down. She did some tests, and she asked me. Uh, she knew that I'd been on a long-haul flight, so, I mean, this was a pretty big deal. It could have been deep vein thrombosis. And she said... Uh, how much water did you drink? And I was thinking, what does that have to do with anything? But apparently dehydration, not inactivity, is the main cause of deep, deep vein thrombosis. So, of course, you should move around while you're, while you're flying, but staying hydrated is, is a really high priority. Yeah, so before this, but especially after this, we've always carried water bottles with us on board. And the rules around liquids do make that a bit tricky or expensive at least because going through airport security you can't carry any liquids more than 100 mils with a few exceptions water bottles aren't one of them so we often end up sculling water like mad whatever's left just before we go through security and then on the other side uh, we'll fill it up from a water fountain or water dispenser and then you know we're fine around the airport make sure it's full again before jumping on board the plane. And that's normally all well and good. If there aren't any water fountain staff members at a cafe will likely fill your water bottle up with tap water for you when you buy something else. Or, or even um, if you just go up and ask nicely. Yeah, yeah. Or if water isn't safe to drink, of course, buying bottled water is a good idea. You know, there's this weird lull where you can't get any water. And it's the time between when you leave the airport terminal And about 20 minutes after the plane takes off, when the cabin crew are able to move around. And it's this time, I think, is the most essential. Because you think, oh, yeah, that's fine. I'll just jump on the plane and I'll wait and I'll buy some water at the first, you know, service. 
that can really come back and bite you because if you end up sitting on the tarmac for a couple of hours, you can end up without any water depending on the, the competence or the, the systems of the airline crew. Yeah, we found that at one point we had a secondary screening and we weren't allowed to take any water into the gate. So we, we passed through security, we're sitting at the gate for an hour, got on board, waited for an hour. So it's like full two hours. I had no water and I was really frustrated because I, I like pressed my button, but the, the flight attendants wouldn't give me water until the first service. And so I think if you can get water, make sure you get it and take it with you. Yeah, so be good for the environment and use a refillable water bottle uh, where you can, either a metal one or the ones that we have. I think the brand's called Vapor, mm -hmm. like Vapor, V-A-P-U-R. And there's other brands that are really similar, but they're plastic uh, ones that you can roll up. So they take very little space in your bag when they're empty and they expand as you put water into them. We also recommend you take some snacks like muesli bars, maybe carrot sticks, sandwiches, something like that. On our most recent flight, we just went to a bakery and bought some nice sweet bread and some cakes. It was a good idea. And we also recommend some sweets for takeoff and landing to suck on because of the change in cabin pressure. Sometimes your ears get a bit sore. I personally like halls. Sweet. Well, um, how about clothes? Because even though we've got all of our clothes in this big bag, mm -hmm. is there anything that you'd put in the little bag? Well, yeah, because... The temperature of planes can vary ridiculously. I mean, I find that it tends to be slightly chilly, but it can also vary from freezing to sweltering. So I always wear a long sleeve top or have a long sleeve top with me if I've been traveling somewhere warm. So yeah, I'd recommend a lightweight long sleeve top, uh, maybe a scarf, which I use. It doubles as a cushion if needed. And if you've checked your bag and you're not carrying a larger carry-on size bag, I highly recommend you bring a full change of clothes in a small bag so that if you need to get changed, maybe if someone spills water on top of you or something like that, you've got that available to get changed into. Yeah, that's a great idea. It also means if your bag goes missing and uh, isn't available, you know, it's been sent somewhere else, you've got a change of clothes to get you through the first day of wherever you are while the bag arrives or, you know, you go out shopping with your insurance money. Mm -hmm. So toiletries is another thing that you don't need very many of if you're, if you've got your larger carry on size bag with you in the overhead locker. But if you don't have it with you, then you'll want to have a few things just in case. Um, I recommend you always have lip balm, maybe painkillers and other medication. Uh, you might want to brush or comb just so you can tidy up a bit after sleeping. We recommend a toothbrush, toothpaste and deodorant and also moisturizer. One thing to be aware of, we mentioned medication. Uh, we really strongly advise against taking sleeping tablets while flying because we've heard some really hilarious stories about things that can happen. But also we recommend that you just try to stay alert as much as possible. You know, if something happens, you want to be with it. But you could take something that just helps you get to sleep but then doesn't keep you under. So something like melatonin could be a good option. So wrapping it up, if you're not traveling with kids, of course, that's a whole other ball game. There's a few other bits and pieces that you might want to have. Things like a pack of tissues. Yes, appropriate at this point. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> also, if you're a girl and you've got your period, you'll need tampons or some other kind of uh, period equipment. Definitely. You want to bring with you anything that you can't afford to lose. Uh, you know, the closer you keep something, the more likely it is to stay safe. And I don't know what your personal proclivities are. So anything else you know you'll want during the trip should be added to this list. So there it is, our complete guide to what to pack in your carry-on bag. Have a great flight. I want to say another thanks to our sponsor, Smart Buy Glasses. We're both big fans of buying our glasses online. We do that all of the time because we know we can get reliable quality and get it shipped wherever we are in the world. And also buying from an optometrist can often be really, really expensive. So we always keep our prescriptions up to date. We go to the optometrist, get our eyes test, and then buy the glasses online. <laughs> One time I was very stupid. I went into a sauna and my glasses were destroyed. And so I needed new glasses. So I ordered them online and... Because we were traveling, we were doing this job, we were traveling around Austria teaching English, and I needed somewhere to get them sent, and the, the shipping time frame was a bit wide. So I had them sent to my friend in Linz, and she and her dad traveled all the way across the country to bring them to me, which I thought was really sweet. So these days I always carry a backup pair, just a cheapie. So we really recommend buying glasses online, either as your main pair or just as a backup pair if you need something uh, to have in your bag while traveling. 
So check out smartbuyglasses.co.nz. They offer a 100 days return policy. They've got a two-year warranty that really reduces the amount of risk that you've got from buying online. One thing I'd recommend if you're buying glasses online for the first time is to check the width of your current glasses and buy something with a similar width. Yeah, that's right. I have a really narrow face and the first online pair I bought, well, I just wanted to get a cheapie. So I bought one of the cheapest pairs available. I didn't really realize that the size of glasses varied wildly and they were far too wide for my face. They looked terrible. So yeah, really take the measurements and uh, try to get something similar. Yeah, I'm sure you'll have a great experience, smartbuyglasses.co.nz, and you'll be redirected to the right store wherever you are in the world. Talking about wherever we are in the world, we're going to be staying down in Australia, New Zealand for a bit. Yeah, we are heading back to New Zealand. We're planning to be there for a little while. And we were facing the idea of going back to New Zealand and not having any flights out, which we found a bit scary. But luckily, Air New Zealand was having a sale. So we bought some flights back to Melbourne for March next year. So we're kind of putting off the thought of stopping completely until March. Then we'll have to face it again. Yeah, we are looking at doing less travel for a while because Linda wants to get back into teaching. And there's one thing about teaching in classrooms is that the classrooms tend to be pretty much in the same place most of the time. Yeah, I don't know how that works. (laughs) Well, we're going to find out and give it a go over the next year and uh, see what happens. We'll still be traveling, though. We've got the entire Pacific to explore. We've got a lot of Southeast Asia that we haven't been to. And of course, we've got all of Australia and New Zealand to get back into as well. So there'll still be a podcast. There'll still be lots of travel stories and uh yeah we're looking forward to that but we are going to be slowing down and we're well, not slowing down so much we are going to be in places for longer while uh, linda gets back into teaching yeah it should be good well that's us for this week until next time travel well